Good morning, everybody. It is time for another morning Bible study. I'm your host, Logan McCulley, and this is the spot where we get in depth into the Bible. I'm learning, you're learning. I'm not a pastor, I'm going to be honest, but that's okay because the Bible's here for everybody. Now, we're in Revelations 13 today. We did 12 last time. We talked about the woman, the child, and the dragon and what that represented and how that's going to go out. So, you know, the devil, Israel, Jesus. That's what we're talking about. The woman is the Israel, dragon's the devil, the child was Jesus. This time, I didn't know we're gonna get how it was going to go last time, but I went ahead and read ahead a little bit. In 13, we're going to get into two things. It's titled two different things, the beast from the land and the beast from the sea. We're going to be talking about the Antichrist and his religious zealot, his other servant, the other demon. And we're also going to get into where 666 comes from and what does it stand for biblically. Because I know, here's the thing, I know there's a lot of things out there that you hear and you're like, oh, that, that's not good. Like you hear, you see like 666, like you're getting changed from Kroger or whatever. And you see it and you're like, oh, that's not good. Why is it not good? What does it represent? That's what we're going to get into. What is the Antichrist actually going to do? Who is this other person that's going to be coming with him eventually? And what are they going to do to try to convince us of their deity, if they can, if you want to call it that? So, with that being said, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into verse 1. <clears throat> Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority." And I saw one of the heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Alright. Let's stop there. Let's break down what we just read. Okay, so we're talking about this beast that came out of the sea. Then I stood on the sea, stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads. Seven heads? Okay, that's interesting. Ten horns, and on top of the ten horns, ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Let's get down into it. Now, this is interesting. At the beginning of 13.1, it starts with, Then I stood. All right, most manuscripts read, he stood, referring again to the dragon or Satan. He takes a position in the midst of the nations of his world, represented by the sand of the sea. So, then I stood, or then he stood. So, how do we want to take that? Then I stood at the sand of the sea. So, either John stood in the sea and saw a beast, or Satan stands at the sand of the sea, and now he's taken up his position within the world. All I can say is prayer on that one. All right, and pray, 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 pray. Uh, a beast, we was talking about a beast, and having, s oh, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This in Latin actually means a monster, which describes a vicious killing animal in this context, the term represents both a person, being the Antichrist, and his system, the world. The final satanic world empire will be inseparable from the demon-possessed man who leads it. For discussion of Antichrist, see notes on some places. Okay. Uh, rising up out of the sea. The sea here represents the abyss or the pit, the haunt of demons. The picture is of Satan summoning a powerful demon from Satan, or a powerful demon from the abyss, who then activates and controls the beast, being Antichrist, and his empire. Alright, so what's the picture here? This Antichrist is someone that's going to be in charge of a government, of the world government, somehow, somewhere, someplace. Then he's going to, the, the thing that's in this person will be have summoned from the pit of hell. 
And this imagery of the beast is describing the different attributes of this person. All right. So then we go on and describe the beast a little bit more. The seven heads and ten horns. This description is like that of Satan back in 12.3. The heads may represent successive world empires, talking about Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and the final kingdom of Antichrist. This final one is made up of all the kingdoms represented by the horns. Ten is a number that symbolizes the totality of human, military, and political power, assisting the beast, or the Antichrist, because remember what he represents. As he controls the world. Horns always represent power as in the animal kingdom, but both offensive power and defensive power. Daniel shows that the human Antichrist will rise up from these ten kings. John picks up the numerical imagery of Daniel, which refers to the ten toes on Satan's clay and iron feet. The apostle sees the beast as the final world government. The Antichrist, anti-God coalition, headed by a revived Roman Empire, having the strengths of various world powers, yet mixed with the weakness and ultimately crushed. The crowns show regal dominion of this confederate kingdom. Alright, seven heads, ten horns represents how much dominion the Antichrist has over the world and what he's doing, or at least over the world government. Let me, let me, let me put that qualifier there. Blasphemous name. Where do they say blasphemous name? And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Throughout history, every time a monarch has identified himself as God, he has blasphemed or blasphemed the true God. Each ruler who contributes to the beast's final coalition has an identity, wears a crown, exerts dominion and power, and therefore blasphemes God. I was thinking about that, actually, because we talked about that in our men group, about if God does not allow even images of himself, because an image would just represent him poorly, Okay, so like he's he's a jealous God. He don't he doesn't even want an image of himself. The closest image that he allowed was Jesus Christ. Okay, God is God, right? So where does it fit into the pieces of the puzzle when people like to wear a crown and call themselves a king and don't know Jesus and don't know God? Like, is that why? This this is a stretch, but is that why like? All those monarchs had such rough to goes at it because they were impersonating God, blaspheming. I don't know if that's the right verbiage, but I was just thinking about that. Like, I don't know if I necessarily want to wear, like, this is going to sound silly, a Burger King crown. Like, I was thinking about that. Should I even wear, like, one of those silly Burger King crowns that they used to give out? Like, the little paper ones that doesn't matter? I don't know. But, like, do I want to, like, have that imagery? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that's something that I really want to want to push the line on at all. Sorry, that was just a sidebar. Uh, so let's go into verse two. Now the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Leopard. A metaphor for ancient Greece, alluding to the Greeks' swiftness and agility as their military moved forward in conquest, particularly under Alexander the Great. The leopard and subsequent animal symbols were all native wildlife in Syria and Israel, familiar to John's readers. All right, so he is described, oh, is, does it say like? Was like a leopard. Like, 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 like. He likes to use that word in, in trying to describe things he can't describe that well, Okay. Because then again, this is still a heavenly experience. So how do you put that into just words? How do you describe what's going to happen in heaven into words? It's hard. It's hard. So like a leopard. All right. Like a bear. Like a lion. Anyways, the leopard, we said that. So the bear part. A metaphor for the ancient Medo-Persian empire depicting the kingdom's ferocious strength combined with its great stability. All right, so fat, swift as a leopard, uh, strong as a bear. What about a lion? 
a metaphor for the ancient Babylonian Empire referring to the Babylonians' fierce, all-consuming powerful as they extended their dominion. So, swift, strong, powerful. Strong and powerful? Mm, kind of the same thing. The dragon gave him his power. Now, we've talked about that, but let's go hit it again because, you know, I'm a big believer in refreshing our memory because things can just get muddled up so quickly. So, what was it, 12-9? We were just there, and I don't even remember exactly where it was at. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, that don't make no sense. He knows where it's on. 12-9. All right. Satan and his demons were cast out of heaven at the time of their original rebellion, but still have access to it. That access will be denied, and they will be forever barred from heaven. I think, what? All right, let's go back and read the original breakdown. We're talking about the dragon gave him his power. I think what we're really looking for is this other breakdown right here, talking about he deceives the whole world. When we talk about the devil deceiving the whole world, as he has throughout human history, Satan will deceive people during the tribulation. After this temporary release from the bottomless pit at the end of the millennium, he will briefly resume his deceitful ways. All right, let's go back then. <clears throat> Notes on verse 1. We talked about that already. Interesting. Okay, so the dragon gave him his power. The dragon being Satan. Satan gave the Antichrist these powers. Which is scary, because this is going to happen, right? It is going to happen. All right, verse, where are we said? Are we even verse three? We're not even verse three. Let's go hit verse three. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So, okay, I heard that and I went, that's interesting, okay? And you can read the breakdown and you're like, whoa. So let's get into that. What are we talking about when we say he was mortally wounded? All right. And his deadly wound was healed. This statement could refer to one of the kingdoms that was destroyed and revived, but likely refers to a fake death and resurrection enacted by the Antichrist as a part of his lying deception. We just talked about how the devil loves to deceive. The world marveled at that lying deception. People in the world will be astounded and fascinated when Antichrist appears to rise from the dead. His charisma, brilliance, and attractive but deluding powers will cause the world to follow him unquestioningly. So there's going to be a fake death and fake resurrection for this Antichrist. You're going to see the scar on there. Is the scar real? I don't even know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but the fake death and the fake resurrection. I think it's important to know that. Because there will be great signs that the devil can do to try to mislead you. This happens to be one of those that he just faked. But he is the great deceiver, so who's to say that you or I will be able to see through it? How can we see through it? All I got is God. I got God. I got God, and I know he won't lead me astray. But it's good to know these things are out there. That it's going to happen. And that I need to be on guard. That I need to be questioning, that I need to make sure if it doesn't match the Bible, I need to be questioning it. Uh, four, verse four. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? That's people of earth right there that are saying that. Verse five. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So again, 42 months, we've heard that time. We're going to talk about three and a half years. The beast was given. The sovereign God will establish the limits with which in which Christ will be, or the Antichrist, will be allowed to speak and operate. God will allow him to utter his blasphemies, to bring the rage of Satan to its culmination on earth for three and a half years. 
I'm going to talk about that 42 month period. The final three and a half years, or 1,260 days of the time of Jacob's, known as the Great Tribulation, this last half is launched by the abomination of desolations. See notes on Matthew 24, 15. Now, I didn't go back and look at this earlier, but I feel like there's something to be talking about because we're talking about, what are we talking about? The abomination of desolations. I don't know what that is. That's a Matthew. So... Let's go see what it's about, because I would like to know. There's only one way to find this kind of stuff out. The only problem with the reference Bible, guys, is it's so large, sometimes it's hard to get somewhere fast. And I am not a Bible driller in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Like, I've seen people do it. I'm just not quick. All right, let's read 24.15. This is in Matthew. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So the abomination of desolation. This phrase originally referred to the des desecration of the temple by At oh, gosh. Antichus, Epiphanes, king of Syria in the 2nd century BC. Antichus invaded Jerusalem in 168 BC, made the altar into a shrine to Zeus, and even sacrificed pigs on it. However, Jesus clearly was looking toward a yet future abomination of desolation. Some suggest that this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. However, the Apostle Paul saw a still future fulfillment as did John, when the Antichrist sets up an image in the temple during the future tribulation, Christ's words here therefore look beyond the events of AD of what happened in 70 AD, to a time of even greater global cataclysm that will immediately precede his coming. So what are we saying? So the Antichrist sets up an image in the temple. And that's what we're talking about. So that that is the abomination of desolation. In this tribulation period, bef right before Christ returns, the Antichrist will set up an image in the temple during that tribulation. And it's verbatim, though, so far as talking about looking for the reference phrase, the abomination of desolation. So that's cool. Now... Trying to find out where I got off track. All right, we're in 13.6. Oh, you know what? I need to read 13.6. Then he opened his mouth in, a bla in, in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacles, and those who dwell in heaven. Uh, his name. We're talking about God. This identifies God and summarizes all his attributes. His tabernacle, this is symbolic of heaven. He's blaspheming all these things. Those who dwell in heaven, the angels and the glorified saints who are before the throne of God and serve him night and day. That is what he's blaspheming. Then in 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation to make war with them and overcome them. The Antichrist will be allowed to massacre those who are God's children. It wants us to look ahead. I don't usually like looking ahead to seeing a different note, but, you know, let's go forward. We're in 17.6 now. The blood of the saints, the martyrs, and of Jesus. Some see the first group as Old Testament saints and the second as New Testament saints. An unimportant distinction since this pictures the martyrs of the tribulation. John's point is that the harlot is a murderer. False religion has killed millions of believers over the centuries and the final false system will be far more deadly than that of any that preceded it. I'm going to read the last uh, sentence. 
false religion has killed millions of believers over centuries, and the final system will be far more deadly than that of any that preceded it. Look at what has happened to Christians in the past and know that it's going to be worse for us in the future. It's a scary statement. But God. But God. But God. You know, I heard my pastor one time talk about he hopes that he has the faith. That if someone like held him at gunpoint and was like, denounce Christ or I'll shoot you. That he could do it. Because he's like, you don't know until you're there. You really don't know. Like, I have been fa- I am a faithful servant. I love God. I am faithful to Christ. He goes, I hope that I can have as much faith as those people did back then. Like, I pray for that daily. You know? I got something I need to pray for, too. That's one thing about Revelations. It has really been a sombering moment of like, hey, your life's good, Logan. But life in general will get bad. Either it's going to happen in the future. So, like, either you'll experience or your grandkids will experience. Either you need, to, you need to be prepared and you need to prepare your children for this so they can prepare their children. Because it's going to happen at some point. So, at what generation will it happen at? I don't know. But here it is. It's going to happen. Be ready for that. Mm. Uh, let's go into 8. Verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I want my name in the book of life. Let me tell you that. I won't be doing that. Uh, the Lamb slain. The Lord Jesus, who died to purchase the salvation of those whom God has chosen, was a fulfilling eternal plan. We know that. Let's go see what the book of life, what their reference is. I think I know, but when I say I think I know, I want to make sure that I know. Book of life, a divine journal that records the names of all those whom God has chosen to save and who therefore are to possess eternal life. Under no circumstances will he erase those names, as city officials often did of undesirable people on their rolls. That's the list of heaven. So, I want my name on that list. Uh, And then they're written on there, from the foundation of the world. According to God's eternal electing purpose before the creation, the death of Jesus Christ seals the redemption of the elect forever. Antichrist can never take away the salvation of the elect. The eternal registry of the elect will never be altered, nor will the saved in the Antichrist day worship him. If you're saved, if you know Jesus, you will not worship the Antichrist. That makes me feel better, man. That does. Because, like, I don't want to be, like, deceived. Like, check it against the Bible. All right, let's get read. Nine, we're going to finish up nine into, I think, ten, maybe. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. That's verse nine. Boom, done. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And we'll get into why that is. Verse ten. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the faith of the saints. So why he with an ear let him hear? Uh, Verse 9. This phrase omits what the Spirit says to the churches, as in the seven letters, to the churches, perhaps because they have been heavenly raptured. It's literally the first little phrase of those longer previous letters that we read, right? Or the previous chapters. It's the first little phrase. So it's like, hey, here it is, but you've already gotten it. Or you've already been raptured. It's like a, it's like a callback. It's a reminder. It's there. That is, I just, I, when I saw that, I was like, that is so freaking cool. That is so cool. If anyone has an ear, let them hear. Period. Done. You get it. You know what you're talking about. You've been raptured. Whatever you want to go with. We're good. And then we move into 10. And 10 is calling out people. So I'm going to reread 10 though. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the faith of the saints. A call for believers to accept persecution from Antichrist with perseverance and endurance. God has chosen some believers to be imprisoned and executed, which they must not resist, but accept with the patience 
such sufferings as God ordains for them. Again, a stark reminder of what we need to be prepared for. Like, our salvation comes at a cost. It's nothing that we get it. it serving Jesus comes at a cost. Are you willing to pay it? There's some hefty fines in there that we've read. It's something to think about. It's something to really, really think about. Alright, let's read verse 11 through 18. It's going to be a large section, but then we're going to come back and break it down piece by piece. Then I saw another beast. Now this is the beast of the, land, the earth. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who, whose deadly wound was healed. He performed great signs so that even he makes fire come down from the heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he is granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who has wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as he would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Here we go. That's a lot. That's a lot. So who is the second character? This is the beast from the earth. So you have the Antichrist. He's the leader of the, the world government, right? Let's talk about this other beast. This is the final false prophet who promotes the Antichrist power and convinces the world to worship him as God. This companion beast will be the chief, uh, most per pervasive proponent of satanic religion. Antichrist will be primarily a political and military leader, but the false prophet will be a religious leader. So this is the religious zealot accompanying Antichrist. Politi pol 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 politics and religion will unite in a worldwide religion of worshiping the Antichrist. All right. Why did he come out of the earth? Likely another reference to the abyss that lies below the earth. The false prophet will be sent forth and controlled by a powerful demon from below. The earth imagery, in contrast to that of the foreboding mysterious sea, may imply that the false prophet is a subtler, more winsome, and more winsome? Wins more? A subtler and wins more than the Antichrist. Interesting. And that's out of the earth. Now, why has he got two horns like a lamb? I read that and I went, oh, that's weird. Two horns like a lamb. This describes the relative weakness of the false prophet compared to the Antichrist who has ten horns. A lamb only has two small bumps on his head, very inferior to the ten-horned beast. But then you say, let's break down just the lamb part. So he has two horns like a lamb, but he's like a lamb. The lamb imagery may also imply that the false prophet will be also a false Christ masquerading as the true lamb. Unlike Antichrist, the false prophet will not come as a killing, destroying animal, but as one who appears gentle, gentle and deceptively attractive. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Because what we just said was... He's another beast coming out of the earth sent from the devil. Okay, He's demon-possessed. Demon he's like a lamb, like a lamb, like a lamb. So multiple things. He's not going to be as powerful as the Antichrist, but he's going to be deceptive. He could even be a false Christ because he's like a lamb. It's going to get scary. It's going to get scary. 
but the lamb spoke like a dragon. The false prophet will be Satan's mouthpiece, and thus his message will be like the dragon. Satan, the source of all false religion, spoke like a dragon, spoke like the devil. This is crazy. And he goes on and makes the whole world worship the Antichrist. Now, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. In verse 12, it says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. How does he exercise all the authority of the first beast? The false prophet exercises the same kind of satanic power as Antichrist because he is empowered by the same source. He too will have the worldwide influence and reputation as a miracle worker. Mm, mm, mm. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. All right. A key, this, what do we call him? The beast from the earth? Does he have another name? This prophet? No, he's not a prophet. This antichrist assistant? We'll call him the beast from the earth. The beast from the earth causes people to worship. He causes, is used eight times of the beast of the earth. He wields influence to establish a false world religion headed by the antichrist and to entice people to accept the system. Mm, he causes. He's that deceptive. And then he talk, and then we're still in 12. We're still talking about that. He causes people to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This likely refers to the carefully crafted deception of a false resurrection and a false murder to inspire allegiance for the world. Talking about the false death and false resurrection of the Antichrist. In 13, he performs, talking about the dragon, or not the dragon, the beast of the earth, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from the heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Great signs. I don't like that. I hate it when that happens. The same phrase is used of Jesus' miracles, which indicates the false prophet performs signs that counterfeit Christ's Christ's. Satan, who has done supernatural work in the past, must use the strategy of false miracles to convince the world that the Antichrist is more powerful than God's true witness, including Jesus Christ. I don't like it when the devil or demon inspired, the devilly powered people do great signs. I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it, and I don't like it at all. It just, I don't know, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Because I'm not that smart. I'm not that smart. So, like, could I be one of the people to get swayed by that? I don't know, maybe. Like, I don't know. Like, that's why I'm studying this Bible, so that I can become a little bit more insightful and knowing God's character a little bit better. Because uh, I don't want to be that guy. Fire come down from earth, or fire come down from heaven. The, 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 the context indicates that the false prophet does counterfeit pyrotechnic signs to continually to convince men of his power, and also an imitation of the two witnesses. I just don't like it when that happens. It just kind of takes like the wind out of my sails. Mm. All right, let's keep moving, though. It's going to get worse before it gets better. 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who has wounded by the sword and lived. Make an image. So we're talking about that wound again? Hmm. Make an image. This refers to the replication of Antichrist that is, that is related to the throne. He will erect during the abomination of desolation. Halfway into the tribulation period, this will happen in the Jerusalem temple when Antichrist abolishes the former false world religion and seeks to have people worship him alone as God. The false prophet and anti false prophet, that's what you call him. The false prophet, not the beast from the earth. Now, the false prophet and the Antichrist again will deceive the world with a clever imitation of Christ, who will later return and reign from the true throne in Jerusalem. They're really going to establish this religion 
or this false religion going at the Antichrist. Mm. 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. I don't get that. Let's get into it. A mark. No, 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 to speak. We're in 15. The false prophet will give the image of Antichrist the appearance of life, and the image will seem to utter words, contrary to what is normally true of idols. That's crazy. Again, I don't like it when that kind of stuff happens, but this is this is this is the accumulation of the Bible. This is the end, this is what's happening. And calls to be killed. His gentleness is a lie, since he is a killer. Some Gentiles will be spared to populate the kingdom, and Jews will be protected. That's it. He's going to kill people. You don't worship the Antichrist, you're going to get killed. Gloriously killed and go to heaven if you're one of us. 13.6. A mark in the... A mark. What are we talking about a mark? 13.16. Let's go back. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their foreheads. Let's talk about the mark. In Roman Empire, this was a normal identifying symbol or a brand that slaves and soldiers bore on their bodies. Some of the ancient mystical cults delighted in such tattoos, which identified members with a form of worship. Antichrist will have a similar requirement, one that will need to be visible on the hand or the forehead. This is when where you hear the whole mark of the beast come from. The Antichrist. That's why people, I feel like, are a little skittish of the Mark of the Beast. Like, when you hear, because, I mean, I am too, like, let's be real. When you start hearing about, like, implantable devices to, like, play with your credit card. Because the Mark of the Beast has ramifications in those same areas. So, let's go ahead and get into the next verse. He causes, oh, where he said that, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't do or get the stuff that you need from like the grocery store. You can't have normal, regular commerce. Like it just, it won't be allowed anymore. So when people start talking about things that are similar to the mark of the beast, yeah, I get it. Like, I don't want that to happen. Like, one, I do, because then that Jesus coming back. The other, it's like, I don't, because I don't want to be a part of that. Right? Like, that's pretty rough. But, you know, Dr. Adrian Rogers said, it's getting gloriously dark. Jesus has got to come back. So, it's going to happen. And, really, if us being a part of it or not, will that change anything? No. So, like, I don't know. I don't know where I sit on that one. Now, the last verse is verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. The beast will have a name inherent of a numbering system. It is not clear from the text exactly what his name and number or number system will be or what its significance will be. It's not clear what his name or number system, we know what his number is, but his number system will be. Okay, that's, that's, I think that's important because you can't draw any other conclusions out of it. His number is 666. This is the essential number of man. The number six falls one short of God's perfect number, seven, and thus represents human imperfection. The Antichrist, the most powerful human in the world, will ever know will still be a man, ultimately, or i.e. a six. So most powerful person still falls short, glory to God. Uh, the ultimate in human and demonic power is a six, not perfect as God is. The threefold repetition of the number is intended to reiterate and underscore man's identity. When Antichrist is finally revealed, there will be some, there will be some way to identify him with this basic number of a man, or his name may have the numerical equivalent of 666. In many languages, including Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, letters have numerical equivalents. Because this text reveals very little about the meaning of 666, 
it is unwise to speculate beyond what is said. And what is said? Uh, Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. The number is 666. One short of the glory of God, three times. 666. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Everything that has happened in Revelation 13 is crazy. And that's end of 13, by the way. Like, what the Antichrist is going to do, and what that means, and then who this false prophet is, and what that's going to mean, and how that's going to affect all of us on the earth. It's going to get war. It's going to get rough, is all I can say. I need to prepare Levi and Jennifer and our new baby for that. Like, faith. Faith. With God. Prepare them with God for that. Maybe maybe I've been a little lax in, in, the, in the preparation. You know? Like doing this a little bit more in depth with them. That's something that I can work on personally. I think that's a good takeaway. What? How can we prepare our families better for what is to come? That's a great question. Because it gets rough and it gets crazy. It gets wild. Let me pray for you and I'll pray for me. Lord, bless the words that we receive today. Let them stick in our heart and our brain and let them just work on us all day as we go throughout our day. Help us honor you in everything that we do. When we work, when we talk, when we drive, help us just represent you for all these other people. We might be the only people that ever, ever represent you to them. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for our daily bread. Please protect little baby Samuel. Grow him all you can. Protect Jennifer and Levi. Protect these people out here listening to this. Bless them. Work in their lives. You know what they need. Help them get in depth into your word so that we can know you better. In your name I pray. Amen. That's it. That's it. We will be in Revelations 14 next time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and exit out. This has been the Morning Bible Study. I'm your host, Logan McCulley, and I'll see you next time. I'm out.